and monsters. They exist among us, and sometimes they win. Even the devil was an angel once. The world has its own rules, and these rules are not human. Some of us seek answers to the origin and existence of cryptids and the unexplained. Join us as we venture beyond the known and accepted boundaries. Welcome to our nightmare. I think you're going to like it. Hey folks, good evening and welcome to another episode of Phantoms and Monsters Radio where we explore the strange and the unexplained. I'm your host, Lon Strickler, and thanks for joining us. Now, if you enjoy our content, then please subscribe, like, and share our presentation. So, um, also, please feel free to leave comments. Uh, Super Chat will be active during the show, so if you want to show your support for Fans of Monsters, please uh, click the dollars icon under the chat. You can also support us by using the Buy Me a Coffee link or banner. Your consideration is very much needed and appreciated. Tonight, people around the world seek the psychic and medical intuitive advice of Sue Walker. She is an internationally known psychic and medical intuitive. For over 20 years, she has assisted individuals, CEOs of businesses, physicians, actors, and law enforcement agencies. Her psychic readings and medical intuitive readings are sought out for their high-level accuracy and detail. Frequently asked to investigate hauntings or paranormal activities, Sue's been featured in various publications, television documentaries, and radio appearances. Sue also conducts training seminars during the year because she desires to educate the public about various forms of psychic phenomena, improve psychic skills, and explore remote viewing, scrying, and energy projection. Sue travels the country presenting lectures and workshops on psychic readings, medical intuitive readings, and other paranormal and spiritual issue. Sue Walker's medical intuitive also taught telepathy. Uh, Sue's website can be found at psychicmedicalintuitive.com. And also joining us will be Bernadette McDaniel, who's an investigator and researcher at Famous Monsters 14 and Research. Uh, she'll be here as a co-host. And she will soon be premiering her own show, Paranormal Life, on Phantoms of Monsters Radio. So, uh, Sue, thanks for coming this evening. Oh, Lon, I've been looking forward to this all week long. Uh, Friday night, I just, I thought, hey, we're going to relax. We're going to have fun. We're going to talk about Sasquatch. And even for Sasquatch researchers, we'll delve into the subjects that are the weird end of things. So, Bernadette, it's wonderful to meet you, too. And uh, when you get your show up and running, let me know. We'll talk. Sounds good. I would love yeah. to have you on. That'd be great. That'd be fun. And, Lon, right. you've had a long week, so let's have fun tonight and just come come at me with all kinds of stuff. And if you've got people in the chat, they can ask the weird and wild questions, too. We aren't afraid to delve into anything. So, Well, let me first ask you how you first connected with Sabe or Sasquatch. Uh, did they come to you or did you find them or how did this <laughs> no. work? No, believe it or not, um, th I connected with the Sasquatch because our extraterrestrial friends, the Ponte, were friends with the Sasquatch and they introduced us. Mm. They were the ones that asked us to attend the first uh, psychic and spiritual Sasquatch conference to teach the telepathy 101 primer course for the first time ever. And they were the ones that let us know that that um, conference even existed. It was Tilcom, this fellow that's up on the screen right now, who let us know that he was good friends with the local Sasquatch clan leader not very far from where I live in the Albuquerque area. If you go north of here, well, less than an hour, you come to an old super volcano that when it blew its top, it was bigger than Yellowstone. 
and it's called the Valles Caldera. And underneath the Valles Caldera is a whole bunch of lava tubes and tunnels. And it's huge Sasquatch territory because there's a lot of, well, everything that Sasquatch needs from caves to uh, food sources to water. And that's the big one here in New Mexico. If you've got a steady water source, then you'll find Sasquatch. But we got introduced to the Sasquatch by the Pondee. And they were the ones that started us on this path with them. So we went up with the Telepathy 101 Primer to teach in Chihuahua, Washington in 2016 at the first Psychic Spiritual Sasquatch Conference. And when we came home from that conference, we'd been home a couple of weeks and it was Oh, close to the fall equinox of 2016. And we had the local Sasquatch clan leader come to us at our home and he made a request. And the request from him was, would you please draw us as we see each other instead of as monsters? And that's what got me started into illustrating and drawing portraits of the Sasquatch from the men, or the, the, the adult males, the, the females, the kids, and everything else. There's one of them. And so that first year, I drew 60 Sasquatch portraits and took them to the same conference that we attended the second year in 2017. And I'm still drawing the Sasquatch today. And now my portraits are sought out for book covers and illustrating the interior of Sasquatch books and other things like that. So I draw them with uh, an emotion that you don't normally see artists portray Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. with and uh, they're a real personable and likable sort of illustration so yeah i got a question already from carol she uh, asked can you they hurt you if you get very close to them well sure sure um if you are trying to do something in their territory that they really don't want you to do um First, they will try and gently warn you off and let you know to leave. Could they hurt you? Yes, but their preference would not be to have you just leave instead of hurting you at all. And with the Sasquatch, normally they will toss something in your general direction. And if it's a pebble, they're playing with you. If it's a rock or a boulder, they're not playing with you. <laughs> they're trying to get you to say, bye-bye, go back to your car, go home. Can they telepathically also influence you so that you're in your car and halfway home before you know it? Yes, they sure can. But do they want to hurt you? No, only if you attempt to hurt them or their kids. They're very protective of their children. Mm. Uh, James, oh. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, oh, I was just going to read James's question too. Go ahead. Uh, James West has a question. What's your take on the relationship between dog or dog man and Sasquatch? They live side by side. Um, the dog men have the same physique as far as size wise. They're still in that eight foot, seven, eight foot tall range plus. They still have the broad, broad shoulders and the, the physique that to me is still a remnant of the age left over of the, the age of large mammals, okay? They've got the body type that's the woo. It's not unusual to see their structures that they build in the forest side by side to one another. Um, I follow 
the uh, YouTube channel that's Colorado Bigfoot that's put out by Mark Abel. And Mark has documented the difference between the dogman structures and the Sasquatch structures. Um, as far as I can tell, the dogmen are not as sociable as the Sasquatch. They tend to be lone wolves unless they need to hunt together for food. And then can they become pack animals or with and, and hunt in groups to drive game together to uh, a certain location so that they're easier to catch? Yes, they sure can. Um, their building techniques are not as nice and neat as the Sasquatch are. They tend to be, oh, instead of the branches stripped off and the bark clean, they tend to look craggy and messier. But um, the Sasquatch and the Dogmen, are, you'll find them in the same environments. I don't know that they pal around together. I think that they do not or, or kind of let each other be. It's kind of like, this is my territory. That's your territory. And as long as we honor each other's boundaries, we're good. That's the sense that I get. Have you ever encountered a dog man? I have not. With I have not, not personally. Um, I have looked, uh, but most of my encounters with Sasquatch have been uh, in territory where I don't see or have not seen the dogmen structures or their building techniques as much as I've seen the Sasquatch stuff. So. Um, I, I, have they ever explained to you their origin? Well... I have two sources of information, one from the Ponte, so the extraterrestrial source, and one from uh, Sunbow's uh, book uh, where Camus uh, spoke to him and uh, let them know. We do know that they've been around since the age of large mammals. So uh, several... <laughs> Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, I'd have to go back. So, oh, you're seeing all of the portraits that are some of my favorites. And, um, but as far as uh, their origins, Camus says that they were created and had their genetics tweaked like we've had our genetics tweaked by star nations. However, um, when I talk to our Native American friends, the Zuni refer to the Sasquatch as um, raw people instead of cooked people. And I said, what's the difference? What are you talking about? He said, well, my, our understanding is if there's been manipulation of the genetics, that's a way of cooking things, uh, treating things differently. And it's been a long time since the Sasquatch have had that occur in their genetics. And so they, they tend to be more raw people. Um, according to the Zuni. I thought that that was a fascinating take on it. Mm. Um, we do know that the Sasquatch <clears throat> prefer to reside in a very simple format without the technology so much. That doesn't mean that they won't utilize technology or borrow it, because we do have reports of Sasquatch and mechanical sounds present around where they are. We also have reports of Sasquatch entering into and exiting from UFOs or palling around with um, the others uh, and the others being other dimensional peoples or other interstellar peoples that visit Earth. Um, you can find Sasquatch on other worlds and you have here um, kind of a, a general division amongst the uh, 
more advanced and the lesser advanced. If I think about the more advanced ancient peoples, the teachers, I think about the conical headed or skull shaped Sasquatch. If I think about the lesser advanced or the learning peoples, I think about the round headed Sasquatch mm. as kind of a general rule. Um, but uh, we do find that some ancients, some of the conical headed uh, Sasquatch, specifically come here to teach the more round headed Sasquatch. And we have reports of that here in North America. So, especially over in uh, Appalachia, uh, Ohio to Virginia to Pennsylvania, that upper area. So, mm. good question, though. Yeah. And I have a I few had... more for you, Matt. Oh, yeah. Oh. Sorry, Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, Jose would like to know. How tall are the adult female Sasquatch on average? They seem slightly shorter than the males. I would have to say on average, I would put them at the seven foot mark uh, as a standard size here in North America. That doesn't mean that you cannot find them shorter or taller, but on average, you find the males eight foot and the females just over seven. So not quite a head shorter, but a good six, eight inches shorter at least um, would be an average. Their shoulder width is not quite as wide. We don't hear reports of five foot wide shoulder width on the females like we do on the males. Um, so the body build tends to be a little, a little bit lesser on average all the way around. That's a good and question. One, one more from Nancy and then. <laughs> what are the Bigfoot family units like? Do they mate for life? Boy, you know, that's a real good question. I think so. I'm not <laughs> sure that I could say that they are entirely um, one, one husband, one wife. In other words, could you have one spouse and three wives or three um, husbands to one wife. That I don't know. I can tell you that their culture is uh, female dominant and that the elder females have the last and final say about who does what. The males um, are, the, are the ones that accomplish what the females want, but it's a matriarchal decision-making hierarchy. And so if there's a food source and let's say that uh, uh, several deer are taken so that the clan can eat, the elder females would be served right along with the hunters. They would eat first. Um, the elder females are the ones that say, you will live here, you will live here, we need to get this, this is our next priority. And so they're the ones that um, are the planners and the movers and the shakers in the clans. The males just help them accomplish that. And Thomas asked, does Sasquatch, Sasquatch get along with more natural animals like bears, deers? Um, it depends. Um, some of those are simply food sources. Some of them you will see a Sasquatch be interested in the young. Like if a Sasquatch found a bear cub, would they eat it or would they play with it? If a Sasquatch <coughs> found a, a fawn, would they adopt it? What would they do? And so we tend to see them not adopting the bears or the deer so much as uh, the deer are the food sources and the bears compete for the food sources. But if it was, say, um, a wolf cub, 
would they befriend it? Or if it was a mountain lion cub, would they not only befriend it, but also use it as a, a companion to hunt with? We have reports of that. There aren't very many, uh, especially the relationship between wolf packs and the Sasquatch is not necessarily a positive relationship because, again, it's a competition for food source. But with the youngsters or the, ch the, the little kids, if uh, they found a baby after a forest fire, would they adopt it and work with it? They could instead of eat it. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so it depends on the animal. If it's a competition for food, they do not tend to befriend it. They tend to... Um, Dispose of it? <laughs> well, kind of let bygones be bygones. And if, yeah. <laughs> if a bear was trying to hunt in their territory, would they have it leave? Yes, they would. <laughs> Um, so. Marla asked, do orbs often accompany the Bigfoot? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Where we see Bigfoot, we see orbs. Um, do we completely understand that relationship? Not completely. We have speculation because of the trans-dimensional nature that we observe with some of the Sasquatch clans. Um, but we do see orbs and sasquatch go together but what are the orbs are they part of uh, uh, the sasquatch clans themselves or are they allies like an extraterrestrial nation or an unseen world trans-dimensional sort of individual that's where we don't know enough yet we are observing and trying to understand that relationship and with a lot of guesses, but not a lot of concrete factual evidence. You, you know, we do hear a lot of different things. I mean, I, of course, I, I get sighting reports of, um, uh, and more and more lately, of uh, these orbs accompanying Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. uh, and quite frankly, we get a lot of cryptids in general that, that have a lot of other paranormal aspects associated with them. Sure. You, know, you talked about with us, you talked about with me with the UFO activity and its relationship to Bigfoot. Maybe you want to talk about that. Well, we know from our Ponte friends that the Bigfoot or the Sasquatch Sabe nations have allies amongst the extraterrestrial visitors to Earth. Part of that is because the Sasquatch communicate in a variety of ways. One, are they verbal? Yes, we know that. We know that they have a verbal language. We know that they speak about twice as fast as you or I do. We also know that they borrow words from the local culture. So if they're in Quebec, will you hear a smattering of French words in the Sasquatch dialects? Yes. If they are down here, would you hear Spanish words? Yes, you might. Um, so we, we know that they borrow names from other cultures to have their kids named different things. That we are aware of. Um, we do know that the Sasquatch enjoy exploring other worlds with the Ponte because our little... Friends from Zeta Reticuli are small, large heads, dark eyes, thin limbs, and almost the polar opposite of the huge Sasquatch, burly, huge body type, strong, hairy, um, can withstand all kinds of environments that other worlds might throw at a Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. And so the two nations like exploring together but we also have observation and photographs of other beings other than extraterrestrials other than dogmen that live side by side and are in the same area as the sasquatch from the woodman the little guys you know under three foot tall that live 
side by side with the Sasquatch. Um, and as well as um, the, what I in general term the trans-dimensional nature of some species. Mm -hmm. In other words, you and I can deal with several different kinds of environmental niches. Mm -hmm. We can go swim in the ocean. We can walk in the forest. We can deal with the hot sands in a desert to a point as long as we've got water. So we can go from one niche to the next to the next. Not all species can do that and survive. The Sasquatch, their niches happen to straddle two different dimensions. And so can they, what we call step across or step between. We've heard them use both terms. We've heard step across more often than we've heard step between. Um, we have a curious report that comes out of Ontario from Sasquatch researcher um, Mike Patterson. And Mike realized early on that the Sasquatch didn't like their picture taken. They were camera shy and so trail cams they, they saw the red beam from the IR of the, the trail cam like a, a, a beam that shot across the forest and they knew where they were all the time they were easy to avoid but what Mike did is instead he got a disposable camera and he taught them how to use it and then left it for them and so can you now go to Mike Patterson's YouTube channel of Sasquatch Ontario and see the photographs that Sasquatch took of the other part of their lives. Yes, you can. And here's the weird part. If Sasquatch borrows a camera at midnight in the middle of winter and it's dark out and it's cold and it's 20 below and it's Canada, the pictures that they take are daylight a different season and there's a strange screen like veil if you want us weaving um, um, uh, like a screen between one side and another side that the picture is taken <clears throat> through so all of the pictures that Sasquatch took have this mesh like appearance that you're taking a picture through but to see what they took pictures of mm -hmm. was fascinating but it was the different time of day the daylight instead of darkness the different season fall instead of the dead of winter and the different kind of lighting a little bit it was um I don't know. There was a different quality to the light when I looked at those pictures. And I don't know if that was just me or something else. But if you want to take a, take a peek, go to Sasquatch Ontario YouTube channel and look at the pictures of Sasquatch that Sasquatch took and put on the cameras for Mike. And he did this multiple times. And so yeah, I found the study of those pictures fascinating. Just fascinating. Do you think they were taking pictures through a portal? I think that that's possible. I cannot dismiss that idea. And because we don't know for sure how no one observed them taking the pictures, we don't have all of those answers, but I cannot rule that out as one of the possibilities. Yeah, that sounds like that may be a possibility. Or, or they have some way of affecting the light. You know, like mm -hmm. when people complain about getting um, uh, blog squat, blob squatches when you get photographs <laughs> of these things. I think they can, I think they can affect that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe when, if they do, they do manipulate pictures on their own when they take them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just a thought, but maybe well, they have the ability to do that. One of the things that Mike wondered, because he 
set the camera on a table inside the cabin that's on the property and watched the pictures, uh, heard the shutter click on the camera while it was sitting there several times, picked up the camera and there were pictures on it from the Sasquatch. But to his eyes, the camera never left the table. Mm. How does that work? I don't have the answer to all of that. So. I have a we, few more questions for yep, you. Yep, go uh, ahead. Yeah, while, while, you're, uh, while you're asking uh, those, the uh, images on the screen now, um, I was looking for all the differences in the physical body types, the color of the skin, how much facial hair, what the nose structure looked like, all of the details and so uh, that's what this particular video was trying mm. to demonstrate <clears throat> was all of the different physical characteristics that we see and it's wide and varied within the sasquatch community just like it is in the earth human community well that, that now i have to ask uh, do they have different races and species we understand that there are different groups that are general groups that you can say, uh, and, and they break them down into seven different kinds mm -hmm. in their structure of, or in their hierarchy of, of doing things. Um, so do they differentiate between, say, the Sasquatches, that are conical head versus round headed. That's one division. But will you also see a difference between the very, very tall, slender Sasquatches and uh, the short, shorter variety that's more in the eight foot tall range? Yes. So do we see differences in their physique as we go from continent to continent and area to area yes we do so is there a division yes you can see see that one short hair tall lean versus squat and this one is medium length hair and airs there's another tall lean individual so the length of the hair the coloration and where the hair is located on the face is different for some um, some have hair all the way up to underneath their eyes, whereas others, the face is, is almost no hair. Um, do we see male pattern baldness in some Sasquatches? Yeah, we do. We do. And so can it be that they have no hair or are very sparse hair on the top of their head? See that one? Interesting to catch it where you can see through it. Mm -hmm. I liked that picture. That was not my taken, but I sure <laughs> liked that one when I saw it. It made a lot of sense to me. So, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> kind of talking around it. Yeah, I just had to, I, I know we got to get some questions answered, but I got, I got to, or asked, and uh, I just, that just popped up, so I wanted to get that out there. So, go ahead, burn that. Okay. So, James West wants to know, how do Sasquatch communicate with ETs? Telepathically, for the most part, uh, with with the telepathic nations. So not all star nations are telepathic, but like our Ponte friends are. And so the Sasquatch and the, and the Ponte communicate telepathically for the most part. If the Sasquatch have to communicate with a nation that's not telepathic, then they go to verbal and gestural. Um, if they need to communicate with each other silently, then they will leave stick glyphs. That's a message on the ground written in sticks. Is, uh, Nancy Malcolm asks, is there any Bigfoot history of fairies and Bigfoot knowing each other? I likely, Nancy, only because the Fey folk would be considered a trans-dimensional nation that's under the two foot tall mark and uh, would they know one another likely 
Would they interact? Not that I have taken a note of or seen. We've seen the Sasquatch build homes, structures out of both wood and stone for the woodmen, the, the little guys in the forest that are under three foot tall. Um, we've seen that extensively, but don't have any reports of the fey folk or the fairy folk and the Sasquatch interacting with each other that I am aware of. That doesn't mean they wouldn't, they would know each other. The Sasquatch know everybody who's in the forest. I mean, it's, it's their house. They know who comes and goes. So. James West uh, wants to know, do Sasquatch ever use a language to communicate with each other? Sure, sure. Um, they have their own language, and again, recordings of their language analyzed by communication experts here um, find that, one, the Sasquatch language has a verbal range that goes much deeper and much lower than our ears can hear. So does their communication, um, is it what we call sub auric, meaning below our level of hearing? Yes, it can go that deep. The Sasquatch have not only language, but they are also extremely astute imitators of any sound that they hear. So like a parrot, if you played a recording of, let's say, the telephone ringing to a parrot, could a parrot um, imitate the sound of the telephone ringing? Yes, they could. Can the Sasquatch do that same kind of imitation of a sound other than a language thing? Yes, they sure can. Um, we have reports of the Sasquatch making snowmobile sounds or engine starting sounds or other animal sounds, um, coyotes or blue jays or whatever. So are they great imitators? Yes, they are. When they're hunting together and let's say they're across the valley from one another, um, will they holler at one another in their own language and talk back and forth? Yes. Uh, do we have recordings of the Sasquatch arguing with their mates? Yes, <laughs> we sure do. And so uh, the verbal language that they use, um, we have yet to my knowledge, to translate adequately. It's easier for us to teach them English than it is for them to teach us their language. I would think it is because you mostly get the reports of people just hearing screams. So, and then you would have mm -hmm. to wonder if they're just basically yelling, like, you know, get off my lawn. <laughs> we're just screaming. Well, so. When when you when you get audio recordings of them talking to one another, it's clearly words and language, not just screams. If they're upset, the, you being in their house or their forest area, and interrupting their day, yes, then they're likely scream and be angry at you. <laughs> Karen asked, uh, "What do Sasquatch think of humans?" Oh, they have terms for us. Um, we are alternately called the noisy ones, the messy ones, the stupid ones, or hairheads, because that's the only place we have hair. Um, do they think that we're very good no they really don't because they observe our actions and consider that we do not treat mother earth very well at all and they are here as stewards of the planet stewards of our forests and so when they see us not taking care of our water and throwing our garbage or starting forest fires on purpose 
then they're not very happy with us and think that we're pretty stupid to do all of that stuff. So they don't have, for the most part, a very high opinion. Now, individually, if they get to know individuals that make an effort um, to uh, treat things correctly and be right-minded, that's a different story. But on the whole, they, they're they not very impressed with what they see. Sometimes yeah, I can I'm agree not with that. Blame them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's only fair to say that. <laughs> so how long do they live for, Carol wants to know? It depends on whether or not you're talking about the conical-headed folks or the round-headed folks. Um, I have heard that with good health, the round-headed folks can live into the 150 to 200 year range if they're lucky or have you know quite good health. However, um, we have reports of the conical-headed folks being very much older than that into the hundreds of years or thousands of years. How much of that is true, I don't know. Um, but when we talk about the teachers, um, they refer to them as the ancients. And so the students of the conical headed Sasquatch that come to teach have the opinion that they are very, very old and very, very wise. Now, how old that is, I can't tell you exactly. Um, are they subject to the same kinds of problems in old age that we are? Many of them are. Many of them are. So. What do they but, do with their dead? Because I know that's a popular um, question. For the most part, we see burial. What we have found is burial sites instead of burning or putting them high in trees or other practices of, of death rituals um, that we see amongst the earth human population. Here, if we're on the water, we let bodies go into the ocean. If uh, you look at some of the Native American practices, they put them high in the trees and let nature take its course. Um, we've seen Vikings or other uh, cultures uh, here on earth burn and do uh, uh, pyres of uh, fires uh, to burn the dead. And so we have a number of rituals, but we have only found evidence of burial with Sasquatch. Go ahead, Lon. I lost my place in the questions. <laughs> <laughs> the Too many questions. Yeah, there are uh, a lot of questions. <laughs> well, you know, you, you you showed that picture of the um, of the interdimensional or going through or crossing through, mm -hmm. and it kind of has that. You know, I have a lot of people ask me. I even posted a question. I mean, posted a, uh, an account today about this glimmer effect uh like in the movie predator the glimmer effect and oh uh, oh i see what you're talking about yeah right. and uh or like there's water running down on top of these things to give them like a glassine look okay or a water effect look yep have yep. you seen or heard of anything like that oh sure oh yes absolutely uh we call it the the heat shimmer effect the look of uh wavy air like you see coming off a hot pavement. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a way for them to purposely go <clears throat> unseen? Yes. Right. Yes, we do have <clears throat> evidence of that sort of uh, an effect. Uh, and we have not just the photos that I showed you, but other photos also of the Sasquatch on the move, but one picture might have a full opaque Sasquatch, the next might 
have a see-through Sasquatch, the next might have that shimmer effect, and the next might be totally gone. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we have seen a progression of that and uh, have reports of that from official sources. Um, ha I should have, and I, I forgot completely, to send you a copy of the memo that was released or leaked from the Nuclear Regulatory Commissioner. Did I, I bet you haven't seen that. No, I haven't. All right. So long story short, um, Sasquatch are frequently seen where nuclear stuff is present, whether that's a nuclear energy plant or nuclear bomb facility. I have received those type of reports. All right. So those reports are, are very factual and... To the point where the the leaked memo said, okay, we don't refer to them in our memos as cryptids. We don't call them Sasquatch. If you see them or need to refer to them, the code word is juveniles. Mm. Okay? And, w and I can send you a copy of that leaked memo. Yeah, I memo. wish you would. Yeah. They did a study on Sasquatch eyesight and to see how acute their eyesight was. And what they did is they set up an experiment inside the fence line of a nuclear facility where they had in the distance um, a night vision um, uh, cameras, uh, three Sasquatch, two adults and a juvenile. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they turned on and turned off lights of different luminosity. So bright light, they might turn on and turn off, um, less bright light, dim light, and then they started going beneath a single candle power or less light that was lesser than a single candle. Mm -hmm. And they, the Sasquatch were Oh, I'm I'm trying to remember if it was more than a mile away, but it was it was about that. So we'll we'll call it a mile away. And what they found is that when they turned on a light that was a tenth of a candle power and turned it off, the Sasquatch still reacted. And so there what we don't know, however, with that experiment was is it solely eyesight? Or was there a telepathic element involved? Hmm. And that's what's that's an unknown that we cannot eliminate from that particular experiment. But they're testing Sasquatch capabilities because they're so frequently around nuclear facilities. They're seeing a lot around military facilities as well now is that because of the armament they they store like if you come here do some of the new uh some of the military bases in new mexico have nuclear material material that's on base yeah could it be that they're here because of that that's an unknown but we do see them frequently around the perimeters and easily able to go inside the perimeters uh, and get over the fencing or through the fencing with no problem at all. So the fencing, even if it's 12 foot tall with barbed wire, does not stop the Sasquatch at all. They can leap over that in a heartbeat. So that's, the, that's a good experiment that I have not heard them talk about yet, is how high can Sasquatch jump? <laughs> I mean, if they really had to, could they sail over a 20-foot tall fence? Probably. How many times our own body height can we jump? And then look at their leg strength capabilities. So, good questions, though. <laughs> Do you think if they did scale the fences or anything, do you think they could be stopped if, if they really had an inkling to get in there? Okay, so 
Can they get in and get out real fast? Yes. Can they be hurt with high-powered weaponry? Sure. If somebody threw a grenade at a Sasquatch, they'd be real hurt. If somebody used um, uh, mit uh, bullets the caliber of, of taking down, let's say, an elephant, would a Sasquatch be hurt by that? Sure. If you had something that could go through the wall of a tank, could it go through a Sasquatch? Yes. Do regular bullets get caught in their fur frequently? Frequently, if you fire a regular bullet from, let's say, a, 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 a small caliber weapon at a Sasquatch, will it even penetrate into the skin? Frequently, it gets stopped by the, by the hair. Hmm. So I have a couple more questions. Um, sure. Nancy wants to know, are ETs working to upgrade Bigfoot DNA? Not to my knowledge. To my knowledge, the Bigfoot have said, uh, uh no more. They have not been upgraded to my knowledge since way early into the age of large mammals. And Jose wants to know, do Sasquatch have foul, have foul smell as often reported? A foul smell? Yes, the males, not the females. All right, and that foul smell frequently is the choice to em be emitted by the Sasquatch. In other words, can they... Can they, like a skunk, put out a foul smell when they need to? We have descriptions from them that, yes, they can choose to be pungent or not. However, we also see reports where some of the Sasquatch live in environments where they don't bathe on the regularity that we do. And so do we see some of the smell associated with Sasquatch are a result of where they live and how often they can get clean? Yes. So if you're in Northern Canada and it's 20 below for the entire month of January, are they going to find some place to go take a bath? Probably not. Does that build up a smell? Probably. I mean, it's that's pretty normal for for any mammal who exudes sweat, and the sweat encourages the the growth of bacteria. It's when the bacteria die off that the smell is emitted, for the most part, for us. That's what that's what our underarm deodorant takes care of. Okay, is is all, right. all of that. So, uh, <laughs> do we see that same stink associated with the the women or the children? No, we don't. So, uh, again, some of it's choice. Some of it is purposeful. Some of it is environmental. Some of it is age and sex related. You also have to wonder if it's not hormonal in a way, too. Mm -hmm. You know what? You have a very good point because I would guess that a young tween age and younger male would not have the same smell factor as an older teenage male Sasquatch. I would agree with that. I think that there's something to that. And also maybe during, like, if they have a mating season, I'm not sure if they do. They might, you know, give off something. You know, we, we, we've checked with them on those things, and what we heard back from the Ponte and from the Sasquatch was this, is that sometimes their teenage males go spend a season in another environmental Sasquatch's clan. So in other words, if I'm a Sasquatch that lives in the high alpines of Colorado, can I uh, have to, 
would I go spend a season in, say, the swamps of Louisiana and hang with the Sasquatch there to see how they live? Yes. So is there a cultural exchange between clans? Yes. Part of that is learning about different environments, but part of it is exchange of DNA so that there is influence of outside DNA. So what I'm saying is if I put a male Sasquatch in a new clan with other female Sasquatch, do Sasquatch teenagers do what our teenagers do? Yes, they certainly do. And right. so and you don't have inbreeding too. That's, that's right. Basically. That's right. Yeah. And so there is outside influence of um, DNA from other clans and exchange that way, as well as knowledge of, oh, you don't build with this, you build with that. Oh, you don't do things this way, you do things that way. And so we do see that cultural exchange as part of the learning about mating stuff and the exchange of mating stuff. Is it possible for a teenage Sasquatch to return to his own <clears throat> clan with a new female? Yes. And so is can he bring back a bride? Yes, he can. Does that new female have to pass muster from the matriarchal elders? Yes. She can't stay if the older women of the clan say, uh-uh. So she has to pass their inspection, so to speak. Oh, I feel bad for her. <laughs> I mean, can you, can, <laughs> can you mean, imagine? Yeah. One mother-in-law is bad enough. Could you imagine like a whole group of them? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so Lori asked, do Sasquatch save shift? Do Sasquatch save what? Shape shift. Oh, shape shift. Um, not to my knowledge, but what we do see is can they use other animals to do things for them? Um, let me give you a for instance. If I'm a Sasquatch and I know that a car has just pulled up and earth humans have gotten out, but it's three quarters of a mile away and I don't feel like hiking all the way over there, can I send a blue jay over there to follow them around and report back so that I know where these earth humans are going to are and what they're doing? Could I send a fox to do that? Yes. Could I send... Um, a squirrel to do that. Can I see through the eyes of another animal if I'm a Sasquatch? Yes, I can. That's that telepathic connection with other nations. And so do they shapeshift? I don't think they need to because they can telepathically utilize other animals. And so that's my, oh, there you go. Jose got a super sticker. Cool. I appreciate it, Jose. Yeah, how nice. So that's that's my understanding is there really isn't a need for them to shape shift. James West asked, uh, can Sasquatch acquire any diseases from humans? Sure. If so, could you give any examples? Could they be subject to the same kind of viruses or allergies that we are subject to? Sure. Can you get, can, can you have a Sasquatch catch a cold? Yeah. You can get those kinds of runny nose or runny eye viruses or coughing viruses, mucus viruses in just about any mammal. So can your cat catch a cold? Sure. Can your dog? Yes. Can the Sasquatch? Yes. Um, are they subject to things that they react to badly? Like, um, well, if I 
touch poison ivy, I react badly. If they touch poison ivy, do they react? I would say probably not, but I don't think that they would do very well if they ate it or if they had it burning, like in a fire, the smoke might affect them very badly because it could get into their lungs. So there are things that are irritants, allergens, and things that make them sick, just like us. Uh, Karen wants to know, do you know their views regarding an afterlife? To my understanding, the Sasquatch are a very spiritual people and they see things in terms of uh, cycles and spirals of cycles. And so do they consider things in an afterlife as in um, we have something going on after we leave these physical bodies? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, I don't know everything about their spiritual belief system. I do know that like most telepathic nations, they understand the collective consciousness because they interact with it. And so the collective consciousness is made up of our spirits, our souls, after we leave a physical body. It's a conglomerate. And do they understand that? Yes, they certainly do. They see everything as going in cycles and spirals. And so physical bodies recycle, but spirits also recycle and return again. Do Nancy would like to know, do Bigfoot recognize a supreme being and do they have rituals for death, etc.? Well, we see them decorating graves with flowers. So I would call that a consideration of rituals of death, that they're honoring a loss and remembering fondly someone that died that they loved. Um, I could not think of any other real good reason for them to decorate a grave with flowers otherwise. Because they're not, they're not planting the seeds. They're laying flowers on top of the area. So do they have those things? Yes. Um, most animals understand when a clan or another member of their tribe, clan, group, whatever you want to call it, is hurting or is sick and needs comforting. They understand sadness and grief. And so they also love children and honor birth. And that new life kind of idea is, again, one of the things that they um, celebrate. We'll put it that way. We also see them observing the stars and the night sky a lot. And so... One of the things that they have described to us is um, almost a competition um, on some full moons. It's not all full moons, but there are times where my clan and your clan might get together on a full moon and have what we call a stomp and growl. A stomp and growl is exactly what it sounds like. <clears throat> I try and make the biggest, loudest, meanest, most stupendous sound I can in competition with you and see who can do it better. Um, do they see who can throw the, the biggest log, the, the largest boulder, who can get it to go the farthest, who's the most accurate? Do they have competitions like that? Yes, they do, amongst each other as well as between different groups, different clans, different tribes. And so a stomp and growl is that kind of get together only on a smaller scale and a, a small friendly competition between groups. Nobody gets hurt, 
purposefully. Um, and everybody has a good time, but it's a noisy event. And to my knowledge, I've only known one researcher who sent me a recording of one and said, what is this? And it was a stomp and growl. They were noisy. They were loud. <laughs> um, so Forrest wants to know, do all Sabe have magical abilities? How do these orbs come into play? Don't know exactly how the orbs come into play, to be honest with you. Um, there has been speculation about trans-dimensional species being able to shift or utilize the orb form as um, a way of observing something or traveling. And do we understand it all? No, we really don't. When you say magical abilities, I'm going to assume that you mean <laughs> abilities beyond what we have. But there are some abilities they have that are beyond what we have that we wouldn't consider magical, like the ability to make a sound so deep, so low, that it stops you in your tracks. A subauric, intense sound. Um, we know other species on Earth that can do that. Tigers can make a subauric sound, and their prey freeze and cannot move. Sasquatch can do that same kind of sub auric sound emission and yeah. you freeze and you cannot go anywhere. Is that a magical ability? It's a different ableness, but I don't know that I would consider that magical. It's not trans-dimensional. Um, we do know of stories where the Sasquatch humor comes out in that if you find a footprint in the middle of nowhere... Let's say there's a, a brand new blanket of snow and in the middle of the meadow, there's a single footprint. No tracks leading up to it, no tracks leading away. Is that a magical ability? Well, it's them walking up to the area in their niche, taking a foot and going into our niche, setting a single footprint down in the snow, picking that same foot up back into their niche and walking away. And so all you see is one footprint and nothing else around it. They'll go to the edge of the forest and usually do that on purpose just to watch the reaction of the earth humans and, and just laugh. Their humor is legendary. The Sasquatch have an incredible sense of humor. And so they, they, will, they love to play. And their kids and their teenagers will come try and bugger you up or play with you if you're a Sasquatch researcher out in their territory. They'll throw pebbles at you to see if you pay attention. If they do, pick up a pebble and toss it back. <laughs> I mean, honestly, they're seeing if you're going to react. And their aim is stellar. If they really want to hit you with it, they will. But most of the time... They just want to see what you're going to do. So I, rec I always recommend take something that would make them happy. And so that, ahead. that actually leads me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> that actually leads me to another question. We have James West wants to know, what are your opinions about gifting? I think it's a good idea. And the reason I think it's a good idea is this. If I travel across the United States and I go to the home of somebody that I've only talked to over the phone, but I've never met in person, I usually take a gift as a thank you for hosting me, for talking to me, for being nice to me in your own home. You didn't have to do that. When you go into the forest to research, you're entering into their home. And they don't have to interact with you. They don't have to do anything. They, uh, they don't have to do anything. However, if you bring something nice for them, 
for their kids or do something nice for them, will they make a good trade back? Yes. The Sasquatch, to our, when, when you interact with them in a good way, are all about a good trade back. And so if you leave them a trail mix bar, they might leave you back a dead mouse. It's food. It's a snack. Okay? So if you leave them, let's say, a couple of quartz crystals, they might give you back a marble. Okay? It's an exchange in kind. If they damage or break something of yours, will they be abject about it and try and make up for it? Yes. And we've seen situations where the Sasquatch will take the, the memory card out of a trail cam and snap it in two and then realize that they've broken something that's not theirs. And not only will they leave you the broken SD card, but they'll also bring something else for you, almost like, a, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to break your stuff. Okay. So we've seen that kind of an interaction too. If you specifically are kind to them and leave something for them in the forest, don't leave it on their walking path, but leave it next to it. Do something that draws attention to it, like put it in a circle of stones or put it on a stump um, and, and mark it in some significant way. But do one more thing. Let them know that you are purposefully leaving it for them and that you haven't just forgotten it in the forest. Because if you leave something and you don't let them know, they might go, oh, huh. They forgot this and not touch it. But if you let them know it's specifically a gift for them, especially if it's something for their kids or if it's food that's durable and can store easily and is a sizable amount. A lot of people say, well, what kind of gift things do you talk about? Um, one of the easiest ones is a watermelon or a melon that has a hard rind or a squash like a winter squash that has a hard rind that's sizable. Okay. Something that they can take back home, carry easily. And when they get to wherever they reside, they can set it down and it'll stay and not go bad. Um, a whole ham, bone and all, is not a bad idea. Again, because it keeps it's easy to carry. And so do they like things like peanut butter? Yeah, they do. I don't recommend a glass jar only because if I give a jar of peanut butter to one of their two-year-olds and they drop it, then suddenly you have glass and a two-year-old and that's not a good combination. So think in terms of if their kids get a hold of it, is it safe for them? So, Sue, uh, can you tell folks how they can get in contact with you and uh, some projects you have coming forward? Uh, anything of interest? Sure. Um, let's see here. If you haven't seen it, there is a documentary that we released this year about Sasquatch that was done by Dockside uh, Media and uh, TT Productions and uh, it, it's Secrets of the Sasquatch. And so uh, you can also see um, or look for Sasquatch Speaks and I've been featured in that as well. Um, I have a YouTube channel that's just my name and so if you look up Sue Walker, just remember when I write Sue, I don't put an E on the end of Sue. Mm -hmm. So just S.U. Walker YouTube channel, and you'll be able to see a lot of the artwork and some of the um, other projects that we've done, either with the Ponte or other things that the Ponte have taught us about. 
like the archaeoplanetography stuff, but uh, if you go to Twitter, at Sandia Wisdom is how to find us on Twitter. And our friend Sunbow, who um, uh, translated the book, um, uh, uh, The Sasquatch Message to Humanity. All right. And so Sunbow follows us on Twitter. Um, I've been doing some more artwork and some of those artwork things um, you'll, you might see on the cover of some books coming out soon uh, about Sasquatch or within the pages of those. So frequently some of the artwork gets sneaks into some of those books. Uh, other projects that we have right now, um, we've been putting together a variety of things, educating folks about not only Sasquatch adults, but Sasquatch kids. And so you'll be able to see, if you go to the YouTube channel, um, a series of pictures of, of just the Sasquatch children and what they do when they're growing up. What do they, what do they play with? How do they interact with each other? Um, uh, on Facebook, we have uh, the Sandia Mountain Ponte Crew. And so we have a, a private Facebook group that we talk about everything from ET to Sasquatch there as well. Mm. Um, I also uh, know how to draw things forensically. So if you have a sighting or an experience and you need somebody to draw out precisely the Sasquatch that you've seen or what happened, call me, we can do that. Uh, I've done, I usually do forensic sketches for folks and, and people say, well, how much does that run? It can run 350. It can run less depending on the size and, um, how long it takes and the interaction between right now. I am talking with Mike Patterson of Sasquatch Ontario to talk to him about, uh, Nefetia the Sasquatch he speaks with and who speaks back with him and we're illustrating or doing a portrait of Nefetia and that's kind of in the works right now. And so I don't have anything to show you yet. Um, <laughs> we're in the stage of talking about what does Neff's nose look like. Mm. So we're at the very beginnings there. Well, I want to again thank you for coming on this evening. It's been a lot of been a lot of fun. We had some great questions. Oh too, my goodness, they? all questions the whole time. That was wonderful. So, I like the interaction uh, there. You take care, keep in contact, and we'll be talking soon. Sounds good to me. Hey, thanks so much, guys, and and blessings to you. And if you've got anything else you need to to ask, just you know how to reach me. Um, you can find me on um, psychicmedicalintuitive.com or just suewalker.com. So anyway, I'll talk to you hey, later. Thank you, you so, have so a, much. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, have a good weekend. You too. Now, uh, if you have a sighting or encounter report that you'd like to be considered for the personal report show or FAMS Monsters blog site, uh, feel free to forward to my email at lonstricklerfamsmonsters.com. Uh, I want to again thank my guest, Sue Walker, for joining me this evening. And thanks to each and all of you for watching and chatting. If you made a super chat donation, it's truly appreciated. Uh, you can also send uh, a donation through Buy Me a Coffee or even through my uh, PayPal links on the blog at any time. It's much appreciated. Uh, but again, please like, subscribe, share, and, and feel free to leave comments. Uh, it's, it's much appreciated. So next Wednesday... Uh, there will be another episode of Fams and Monsters Personal Reports at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. I got to get that together and get it out to Vincent, but we'll get that done this weekend. And next Friday, I will be joined by Alice Jackson, John Bullard, and uh, Brad Cooney, who are the cast of the film The House in Between. 
Uh, this is a true life film that centers around a new homeowner in Mississippi who realizes that her life has become a nightmare. This should be an interesting show, and so make sure you join us in the chat, uh, or not in the chat, but if you'd like to ask questions, join us in the chat, and you can, you can definitely do that. So until next week, stay healthy, have a safe, enjoyable weekend. Good night.